Dr. Sada. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for having me here in your beautiful country, in your beautiful city. It's my first time in Australia. It's been an absolutely um, uh, wonderful uh, experience. The people have been overly friendly, and uh, the scenery has been magnificent, and I hope to have many returns. Um, so I'm going to talk today about trends in concrete durability specifications in the United States. Particularly I want to focus on what's happening with transportation agencies and uh, pavements. Um, a couple of things on this opening slide to draw your attention to. Uh, this is one of our major durability issues in the upper Midwest in Michigan. It's um, de um, distress due to the application of de-ice results on concrete. And we get what's referred to as joint deterioration, as you can see here. The cigarette butt is optional. You only find that in Michigan. Uh, but uh, the rest of it is fairly common throughout uh, the Midwest. And uh, again, we're not going to talk about de-ice or distress because I know it's not an issue for you for down here. It is interesting, though, that this is caused by something called calcium oxychloride. And that uh, calcium oxychloride phase, interestingly, forms at above freezing temperatures, typically in that range of 20 to 30 degrees uh, centigrade. So uh, and it's uh, the result of the chloride combining with the calcium hydroxide in the concrete to form the oxychloride. So although you don't have de-icers, I wouldn't be surprised if you had have some oxychloride damage uh, as a result of some of your chloride exposures along the seashore. And it might be something to look at. It's kind of an interesting uh, phenomena. Um, I also want to draw your attention to this down here, Michigan Technological University. Uh, whenever I travel overseas, I always kind of get the same question, and who is Michigan Tech? I've never heard of Michigan Tech. And we constantly get confused with um, some of our other universities in the state. Um, quite often we're confused with the University of Michigan. Uh, Michigan is not very famous for concrete technology. In my book, it's very famous for its football team and probably uh, more famous for its football stadium, which is the second largest stadium in the world. It holds about 108,000 people and it is a work of art unto itself. Um, Michigan is uh, very famous for its law school. It's got one of the top 10 law schools in the United States, and it's very famous for its um, medical hospital and also for its dentistry school. So if you've got a problem with your teeth, you can go to the University of Michigan, but that's not who Michigan Tech is. We also get confused with Michigan State. Uh, Michigan State's also a very famous university, famous for their basketball team primarily. Um, and uh, it is what we call a land-grant institution and in the United States. Each state was given a plot of land to form a university on. Michigan State is the land-grant institution in Michigan. And as a result, it has an emphasis on um, agriculture and veterinary sciences and those types of things. So again, if you have a problem with your cow, you might want to go to Michigan State, but uh, I wouldn't go there for any of your concrete problems. So who is Michigan Tech? Well, we're located in Houghton, Michigan, which is about 700 kilometers northwest of where Michigan uh, and Michigan State are. It's one of Michigan's leading universities, uh, research universities, but we're primarily known for hardy winters. And uh, we get on average about five and a half meters of snow a year, and the record year is 9.8 meters. That was the year I moved there. If you want to know what 9.8 meters of snow looks like, that's it, and that's me. We don't get it all at one time, but we get it all over the course of a year, and uh, it takes a while for it to go away. So again, we're located up here on the south shore of Lake Superior, 700 kilometers from down here in Detroit, where you're going to find Ann Arbor, and, we're, and, and Lansing is where you're going to find Michigan State. Um, and uh, as you can kind of see from this map, the roads kind of end, uh, getting close um, in that area. This point up here on the tip of this peninsula, here's Houghton on this peninsula. This tip uh, point up here on the tip, Copper Harbor, has the distinction of being the city in the United States, uh, the continental United States is furthest away from a four-lane highway. And you can see that that's the case here. Um, of course, we get snow, and so our sport is hockey, ice hockey. As I said in my introduction, I'm a goalie. I take pucks off my face for entertainment. And uh, the first professional hockey team in, in, uh, you know, in North America was in Houghton. And like they say, if uh, life gives you lemons, make lemonade. So we get snow, so we celebrate snow. We have a winter carnival every year where the students build these wonderful statues out of snow and uh, celebrate the winter, if you will. 
And uh, it's not always wintry there. We do have some other times of year where it is very pleasant, some of the most beautiful scenery you're going to find in the uh, United States. The university is predominantly engineering. We have about 60% of our students in engineering, and about 80% of our students are either engineering or science. So a very focused university on engineering and sciences. But we're probably best known for what our students think of us. Uh, some students put the sign up along the road, and they took the photo, and uh, they've been selling the postcards about a buck a pop uh, ever since. And they probably made more money selling this postcard than they have being engineers. But uh, that's, uh, that's Houghton, Michigan. So anyway, that's who Michigan Tech is. And what I want to talk about is concrete durability. I want to talk very briefly about what's happening with uh, ACI 201. We're going to have a session after this where we can go into a little bit more detail about that. And then I want to jump to uh, what's happening in the transportation area, particularly with the uh, pavements. That's the area I work in predominantly is concrete pavements. And so what I want to talk about the adoption of performance-based specifications, which is moving forward in the states. Kind of give you a very brief overview of the technical approach and then uh, kind of the overview of how the states view this and how the uh, industry views this. And uh, then very briefly at the end, I have a, a, a slide or two on the issue of materials and durability. So as we all know, concrete is the cornerstone of civilization. We wouldn't be who we are uh, without concrete. And what really makes concrete concrete is durability. Without durability, then we really have nothing. Our structural performance stems from the fact that it's a durable material. The economy that we get from concrete, the long service life we get, comes from durability. And of course, sustainability is directly related to durability. And we have over 100 years of research looking at this problem of durability, and we've made some tremendous improvements, um, but we still have issues. Um, here's one, ASR. I saw a presentation yesterday. Someone was amazed to see ASR and pavements. I can show you a 1,000 pictures of ASR and pavements. This happens to be in a desert in California, so moisture is sparing, but we still have ASR. You can see it's um, what you'd call very severe ASR. Um, sulfate attack is still an issue, uh, of course, with foundations and supports and those types of things, as, as you can see here. Uh, this was a case of a pavement where we had a high sulfate fly ash, and it just turned to mush on us. So it's kind of an unusual case of sulfate attack. Of course, corrosion, we've heard a lot about corrosion over the past two days. That's obviously an issue everywhere we go. We have the unique problems um, of de ice rescaling and freezing and thawing, and you can, I think, see that now as you see what um, nine meters of snow looks like. We deal with some pretty harsh winters. So uh, we still have challenges. And so we can't keep asking ourselves, why can't we get this right? Why can't we make concrete durable? We know so much about it, why can't we get it right? And there's a lot of things that are said. Is it the materials and workmanship? Well, maybe. That's probably a component of it. Are we measuring the correct properties? As we move forward into performance mixtures, this becomes a very key question. What tests are we going to run? A key question is who's responsible for durability? Right now in the, um, in the um, transportation industry, it's more what we'd call a circular firing squad, where those responsible are summarily executed on the spot, but it happens to be everybody. It's the design professional, it's the engineer, it's the contractor. Um, so that's probably a very key issue is who has responsibility for durability. And that's something that you here, I think, have addressed in your durability guide. And so can we specify durability? That's a question that 201 and everyone is really uh, wrestling with. How can we really move this forward and, and make a difference? We have some inspiration. Uh, we've been looking uh, very um, significantly at your, uh, your documents on durability. Um, it was um, stated yesterday in some of the presentations that what happens here in Australia is not staying in Australia. We are very aware of it, and we are um, paying attention to it, and we are learning from it, and we appreciate the work that you've put into this. And as Michelle Wilson said this morning, we also get some inspiration from our friends to the north uh, in Canada, who have also done quite a bit of work in this area. But we're trying to move into some new territory of our own. Um, committee 201 at ACI is a committee on durability. 
Um, and that committee contains the experts and it really contains the state of the art knowledge on durability that we have in the United States. As Michelle pointed out this morning, our main document, uh, 201.2R, is not a mandatory language document, so it really cannot be brought into specifications. And we have some other internal issues, some, some what you might call political issues, with how do we get other committees within ACI to adopt the knowledge that we have developed. And that's an ongoing, ongoing battle. So we're in the process now, we've just kind of launched this in the past year and a half to develop a um, durability code. And we're in the very initial stages of it. One of the things that we have determined, and, and I think we've pretty well have come to agreement on, is this more than just talking to the design professionals. Durability you know, is throughout the entire project. And so as we move forward, we have to address durability, not from only a design perspective, but also from a construction perspective. The audience is much more than the design professional. We have a number of challenges. Uh, you can see the wide range of exposure conditions we have, again, from 10 meters of snow in the north to Miami where they haven't seen snow ever and they don't even know what snow means. Uh, we've got um, desert in the west. We've got a wide variety of climate conditions. And we have to address the needs of different types of structures as we move forward. Um, and we have to figure out how to integrate what we want to do with our existing ACI documents, which is also not a trivial challenge. Um, and time, we have, we're short on time. This is something we need to address very quickly, we need to solve, we need to move forward very quickly. And so time's of the essence and we're trying to move as judiciously as we can, but it is uh, definitely a difficult process. You've all gone through it and so you know what it's about. So transportation structures, in my opinion, may be one of the largest areas in need of durability improvement. Some might argue with that, but that's kind of my take on it. Um, there's an increasing demand for increased service life from our transportation structures, and that's driven by the fact that we have limited resources to construct or reconstruct those, those, uh, those structures. I don't know about Australia, but in the U.S. we do not have unlimited money to put into our roads. And so we have, um, we have to make best use of what we have. Transportation in the U.S. is not something that falls underneath ACI. Um, it falls under the organization called ASHTO, the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials. That's the primary um, specification writing body for transportation structures. It's an organization of all 50 states. The state highway agencies in each state are members of ASHTO. And what we have in the states are, in the United States, are 50 states who have 50 different ideas on how to do the same thing. And this is a major problem, um, particularly if you're on the, on the materials um, providing side of the business or those types of things. You have 50 different customers you have to please, and they all have a different idea about what the right answer is. There's a new organization that's kind of emerged in the United States called the National Concrete Consortium, which is a volunteer organization. There's about 30 states that are members. And these are the concrete engineers from th these 30 states who get together twice a year and just share knowledge and work towards solutions and it's been an extremely productive group. It's one of the most productive meetings I attend uh, on a regular basis and great conversations and it's, it's really helped in terms of trying to move forward things like this performance engineered mix. Um, Federal highways you might be familiar with, that's the overarching federal agency in charge of transportation. They really have very little to do, in fact you could argue they have nothing to do with writing specifications and tests and codes or anything of that nature. What they do is they hand out the money. What we do is we get we pay uh, taxes on our gas at the pump, and then those gas taxes go to Washington, and then Washington sends them back to the state after taking a little bit off the top for themselves, and then uh, that's what you use to fund the majority of your construction. And so they hand out the money, they have the power of the purse, which is not insignificant, and they're learning how to use that. Uh, Federal Highways now, in cooperation with the NC Squared, has led this initiative for performance engineered mixtures. Um, and they've adopted this ASHTO standard PP84 for standard practice for developing performance engineered concrete pavement mixtures. There's a number of issues they're trying to address in this document. Susceptibility to slab warping and, shr and shrinkage cracking. And so the levers that can be pulled there are paste content, gradation, water to cement ratio, curing. Uh, transport properties of the concrete or permeability is another big issue. And again, the, the things that we can start to look at, cement content, paste content, water to 
investment ratio, the use of SCMs, workability, um, uh, uh, paste content, gradation, water cement ratio are things that we're going to be looking at to try to control to affect workability. And then, of course, freeze thaw durability and chemical de icer attack, which, again, I, I won't uh, dwell on, but it's a major part of what we're trying to accomplish with the performance engineered mix. And so there's really two arms to this. One is a new approach to mixed design, and one is a new approach to testing. And I was very inspired by the whole mixed design thing. I went to one of your concrete producers here last week, and I was really amazed at the uh, prescriptive um, recipes that you have and then the performance recipes that you have over here. Um, so uh, I don't know if we can adopt this, but we're going to try to learn from it the best we can. But what we're doing is that we're looking at these various properties. So one thing that uh, has really been uh, readily adopted is optimized aggregate gradations. Um, Tyler Lay in Oklahoma has developed this tarantula curve. This is based on the Shillstone method, which some of you may be familiar with, or some people call it the 818 gradation. And Tyler has modified this um, um, to uh, be adapted to concrete pavements. And so this type of a gradation curve, <coughs> excuse me, curve is being widely implemented across the DOTs. Um, the other thing that's being looked at very strongly is the use of the formation factor, which you may have heard of also. Formation factor, very briefly, is measuring the permeability of the pace, and it's a measure really of the interconnectivity of the porosity in the cement pace and the tortuosity of that of that uh, porosity. And the way we get at it is by looking at the resistivity of a of the pore solution in this native state, and then measuring bulk resistivity and measuring the bulk resistivity of the, of the same solution in that, in that core. And uh, that gives you the formation factor. And um, again, that's something that's been, uh, I think, fairly readily adopted by the DOTs as we move forward. Uh, increased use of SEMs. Uh, we, I've heard a lot about SEMs here. We have a lot of the same problems in the states. We're seeing a lot more use of SEMs and a lot more relaxed use of SEMs, a lot less prescriptive, um, tell, you know, uh, uh, prescriptive requirements for SEMs and much more show me that it works, I'll specify it. Um, so that's another positive step forward. And stemming from the optimized gradation is the reduced paste content. We have some DOTs that are down on the order of 300 kilograms per meter cube for uh, their paving mixes. There are some DOTs that are still up around 420 kilograms per meter cube, so it varies all over the map. But there's a number of the progressive DOTs that are going down in the paste content, realizing that if you get rid of the paste, you're going to get rid of a lot of your problems. And that all comes from the optimized gradation. New tests. This is where a lot of the issues are, are arising um, with regards to the PEM. I have not met a DOT that has not met a test they do not like. Or they just love tests. They love getting a value, something they can measure, some number they can put on a piece of paper and make you meet that number. And so they like these new tests. Um, we have a new shrinkage test, which is a dual ring shrinkage test, and we really have never specified shrinkage in, for pavements in the past, and now we're specifying not only shrinkage, but a new test for shrinkage. Um, freeze thaw is probably the most uh, controversial test that's been proposed. Um, there's been a test developed by Tyler Lay in Oklahoma State called the, um, he calls it the super air meter. Uh, it's also referred to as a sequential air meter. And what it does is it measures, um, in essence, it gives you a measure which is proportional to the spacing factor of the air void system. So rather than measuring total air content now, we're starting to measure the spacing factor, if you will, and correlating that with performance. And this one has uh, the industry kind of up in arms to some degree. Transport permeability, that's a fairly straightforward test, the use of bulk resistivity. Where the issue has come there is what is the pore solution? That varies with cement and varies with SEM. And so they've moved towards adopting a process of saturating the concrete with a standard solution and using that standard solution then as the basis for measuring the formation factor. Workability, a couple of new tests have been developed. A box test is a plywood box that you fill with concrete, you vibrate it, you pull the sides off and see if, what do you have for bug holes, see if you have any slump. And the V-Kelly is basically the Kelly ball, which was a 1960s test with a vibrator attached to it. Both of these are measuring workability. All these um, mixed design parameters, all these tests are things that are options within the performance engineer mix. No one has to adopt them all. 
but you can adapt what you want as you're trying to achieve certain goals in your, in your mixed design. These tests will not be applied universally. Uh, some of these tests will be applied in pre-qualification. So for example, the workability of that box test will be a, a pre-qualification test. Aggregate reactivity, I haven't talked at all about, but ASR aggregate reactivity, we have the ASTM C1778 document, and there's an uh, ASTRO equivalent, which gives excellent guidance on ASR mitigation. And to date, there is not one DOT that's adopted it, but they all know about it. Uh, shrinkage, as I mentioned, is something new for pre-qualification. Um, construction, QA, the DOTs are going to be looking at the transport properties, uh, the air content and strength. And then from a construction perspective on QC, it's going to be those same three properties plus unit weight and slump and maturity. Maturity is being used to um, predict when it's time to get on the pavement and, and do the saw cuts. And so this is something that's actually been fairly well adopted by the contractors. So, how has it been received? Well, the good news is the states kind of like this. Um, they've been in, in the world of having prescriptive mixes that they've put out, and what goes with that is that they hold the, the majority of the risk, um, and uh, they realize that that prescriptive approach limits innovation. Uh, the performance specifications allow for new materials to be used, new admixtures, other innovations to be used, and they like those new tests. As I said, they really love those tests, and they think they're going to get better control of their projects, and they're going to get improved performance out of the concrete. Uh, and they really like the fact that responsibility now is being shifted to the contractor rather than onto them for performance. They have some challenges. They need to rethink their, their, their quality assurance programs. Um, they need more information to make some decisions on how to do that. And that information is slowly coming through the NC squared primarily as to those agencies. Precision bias statements need to be developed for these new tests. And that's a work that's underway right now, being funded by the federal highways. Um, and one of the concerns they have is the fact that this increases the reliance on contractor quality control program. Because historically, um, paving contractors in the United States have not been good at QC. Um, in Michigan, I know it's fairly common that the only time they run a QC test is when the DOT shows up to run their QA test. And if they don't agree, then they have a dispute. Um, so they need to um, really up their game on QC, and the DOTs, I think, are concerned about that happening. Of course, new adjustments to, to a, a pay, a new pay adjustments need to be adopted as part of this QA process. And but overall, the state highway attitude is positive towards um, towards this new approach, and they're embracing it. Um, from an industry perspective, it's not quite so good. And if you go back to the picture I showed you of that joint deterioration, uh, everyone in the concrete industry wants that to go away. That's bad news because what's happening is those gray roads are turning black with asphalt, either from overlays or reconstruction. And so they, they're losing market share. They want it solved. Okay, so they're, they're, conceptually they're there, but now it comes down to where the rubber meets the road. Um, and it comes back to this contractor QC. The contractor is going to be responsible for making sure that they're meeting the requirements of that mix. And their pay is going to be adjusted if they don't. And, and they're going to be doing that with new tests that they have no experience with. And then they don't know how to adjust them. If they have this new measurement of air content, how do I adjust my mixture to make the air content correct? So there's all these unknowns that are causing great consternation in the industry. They obviously have to absorb some costs for new technician training and certification. All these things have to happen. So overall, the industry is willing, but not necessarily uh, terribly happy about this. Um, the path forward is going to be slow. Uh, the specification is currently under development. There's a new version coming out in 2020. Um, I'm an academic, so I have to say more research is needed because it always is. Uh, but there is more research that's needed on these tests and the applicability of these tests and so on, and that's undergoing. Training is going to be a key component of this, and that's going to happen through NC Square and on-site training. Shadow testing right now, a lot of DOTs are running shadow testing. We're taking the new tests and running them parallel with the old tests and trying to show contractors, look, here's what it tells you. It's not going to be the end of the world. Um, and Federal Highways is developing a model QCQA plan. Hopefully, that will be rolling out in the next year or so. Federal Highways has the power of the purse. They're incentivizing states to do this. And those, so far, we have about 18 states that are moving that way. So last topic, materials. 
Um, the U.S. is facing uh, supply issues with SEMs just like early, just like you're facing here. And here's kind of what it looks like very briefly. The black bars are the uh, fly ash production um, uh, over these years. So you can see from 2008 down to 2017, the last data, we're, we're down to about half of the production. The green line is showing the uh, beneficial use. Well, the green bars are showing the amount of beneficial use in concrete. And you can see that's not really increasing that much. But as a percent of the total ash, that's what this green line is, as a percent of the total ash production, it's becoming significant. We're using more and more of the ash that's available. We're getting into situations where we don't have ash in some markets, and the ash that we do have does not meet the necessary quality that we need. So it's a major problem, and what we're <coughs> doing is we're importing more materials, and we're finding more state highway agencies that are saying to these alternative materials, show me. If you think this will work, show me it will work, and I'll use it. Whereas three years ago, that would never have happened. Um, so the days of rejecting material on a pre prescriptive basis in the United States has really gone away, at least from a state highway agency perspective. Most agencies now are in the, on, in the business of, of tell me it's going to work, show me it's going to work, I'll put it in my spec. And what comes from this also then is more tests. We need better tests for these new materials. Harvested ash is something that's really growing very quickly. We're taking ash out of landfills and ponds. We're processing it. We're using it in concrete. Today it's happening as we speak. So we need some better tests to monitor the, the composition and the quality of these materials. So last, I just have to give a very brief uh, nod to ACI. I'm here as an ACI ambassador, and they asked me just to say a couple words about ACI on that basis. So ACI, their model is to envision or a, a future where everyone has the knowledge needed to use concrete effectively to meet the demands of a changing world. And that's really the role of ACI is to disseminate knowledge out and try to get the technologies adopted. There's a number of different ways you do it, technical documents, publications, certification training is a major part of what ACI does, technician certification. The ACI Foundation funds research, it funds scholarships, um, and provides leadership through a strategic development council. They have ACI University webinars, online learning for professional development, and probably most importantly is the membership and the networking, and it comes from that. Uh, there's over 20,000 institute members in 129 countries, and there's about 14,500 members in various chapters spread around the world. And it's all walks of life, engineers, students, contractors, architects, educators, everyone's involved in this, and it's a, a fabulous organization. And they asked me to say a little bit about my own personal involvement, so uh, wh why do I do it? Um, to me, it's service to our industry. Um, as an academic, I'm not billable, and so I don't have to worry about how I'm going to make the, the paycheck. So I can take time and put it into this organization, and I do. I put a lot of time in this organization, a lot of time in the ASTM. And I provide it as a service to our industry, and I enjoy doing it. It's a vast resource for knowledge, and it's amazed what I learn. And you go to a meeting, if you think you're the smartest person in the room, right off the bat, I can tell you you're not, because you thought that. Everyone else in the room has got vast concrete knowledge, and so, as much as you think you know, there's going to be a at least two or three other people are know as much, if not more. And you're going to learn at every meeting, learn something new. And that's a really fun thing about ACI. Um, Hardworking professional staff, I think this is something that often gets overlooked at ACI. We get these documents and these products out because we have at our disposal some very hardworking professional staff that are dedicated to doing it. And, um, the, the, and I really can't say enough about them. They, they really are high quality and, and we couldn't do what we do without them. The networking is important. Uh, Michelle talked about how some of these problems get solved over a beer in a bar, and that's true. These aren't necessarily just our colleagues or our friends. These are uh, some of my best friends in the world, uh, people I see at these meetings on a regular basis. If you're a young student, I couldn't imagine any better way to get involved in the concrete industry. I remember my very first ACI meeting, I sat down at a table across from Bryant Mather, who was mentioned in a previous talk this morning, who was one of the gods of concrete, and I got to sit down and edit a document on fly ash with Bryant Mather. If you don't think I was shaking my boots, then uh, you're, you're, you're wrong. <laughs> uh, but it was a, just an a, a unbelievable experience. And young people can have that experience at ACI. Um, 
And I always add by saying that the bacon is excellent. If you're a committee on chairman, you get to get up at 6 in the morning and go and have a full breakfast, and they always serve you excellent bacon at those breakfasts. And that's what I like about ACI. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. If you're up north, um, stop around. and we got a cold one waiting for you. Um, and Michelle, I had showed her license plate. I think that's someone's license plate, so I have to show off my license plate, too. Um, fly ash is my life. There's not too many audiences I can say that to, but fly ash is my life. So with that, I'll take any questions. Um, thank you. Technically, I think we're out of time for questions, but yeah. I'm sure you're going to be around this be evening around. and yeah. tomorrow for yeah. anyone who wants to catch up. Okay. And also, thank you very much for presenting. Oh, thank you. Looks thank like you. a bottle. <laughs> <laughs>